Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 88 of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Today's episode will feature an interview with David Wind, and it'll be about his forthcoming book, The Indie Writer's Handbook, which is coming out in September 2019. David's first novel was published in 1981, and since then he has had more than 40 books published in the genres of science fiction and fantasy, mystery, thriller, and suspense. A hybrid author who cut his chops in traditional publishing and then discovered the opportunity in indie publishing, David brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to this interview and to his forthcoming book. He's currently the vice president of the Florida chapter of the Mystery Writers of America, and he has a lot to say about the way by which traditional publishing and traditional published authors in many cases still look down their nose and misunderstand what indie publishing is really all about. David lives in Florida with his wife and their dog. This is a fantastic interview, and I know you're going to enjoy it. Now stay tuned until after the interview, where you're going to hear a chance to win a signed copy of David's new book, and to receive it before the book is available for everyone else. And that is courtesy of David's awesome generosity. Those advanced reader copies, which he has already signed, have already been dropped in the mail to be shipped to me, and once I get them, I'm going to explain, after the interview, how you can win one of those copies that I will ship to you. Now, speaking of after the interview, if you stay tuned until after the interview, you'll also find out who the winners of Patrick O'Donnell's Cops and Writers are. But wait, did you say something about comments? Oh yeah, a few comments to mention this week. There's a comment from episode 81, which was the interview with Jim Cookrell and his nonfiction book, Unskippable, and it came from Jules. Uh, Jules says, I'm listening a little bit late as usual. The catch-up is great, though, and I always look forward to it. I was listening to what you had to say about how once you start to getting the character on the page, they grew and the details of the relationship became clearer. This is the single most important reason why I find I need to write every day, even if my muse is drunk at a bus stop far away. Getting started when you have 100,000 or even 50,000 words to write seems a little overwhelming, but once I start writing and the smaller details become clearer, the characters say things that I hadn't planned on. They reveal things about their personalities or their past that I wasn't expecting, and the story grows naturally, which alleviates my anxiety and makes it easier to write the next day. So even if it's only 500 words, it's so worth it. Any time is worth it. I can't trust my muse, but I'm learning that I can trust the process. We all know how to tell good stories. We just need to start and keep starting every single writing day. Your podcast is one of my favorites, and I love catching up on a Sunday night walk with the dogs. Thanks, Mark, for putting the time in for us. Well, thank you, Jules, for taking the time to share a comment. And I love to share the fact of what works for you in terms of writing. And you're right. Even if it is only 500 words, sometimes it's actually sitting down and getting into the weeds and exploring the characters that really makes it come alive. And the next thing you know, that's 500 less words or 100 less words or however many you actually sat down and wrote. Less words that you have towards your goal. So thanks so much for the comment, Jules. Thanks for sharing that tale. I find it fascinating to see the way different writers approach things. And of course, that's a comment that helps inspire that same thing in me. I'm reading what you're saying, and I think, wow, that is amazing. And it's true. Sometimes just sitting down and getting it done, even if the muse is drunk at a bus stop far away. My muse is often down at a brewery down the street where I need to be in home with coffee in hand and fingers on keyboard. Thanks, Jules, for that great advice. I also received an email comment on episode 87, which was entitled, You, Your Books, and Bookstores. 
And in that episode, I mentioned uh, that I was thinking about doing an episode on libraries if you listeners found it valuable. And of course, one of you reflectives emailed me and I got this email from Carol um, and she says, I'm a regular listener of your podcast and at the end of the last episode, you suggested doing an episode to go more in depth about getting our books into libraries. I would love to hear such an episode that would go into both the ebook and paperback way to get your books into the libraries, possibly the US plus Canada plus UK systems. I've been toying with adding an email in my autoresponder series where I explain to readers what they can do to request that my books be added to their local libraries, but I don't know where to start since my readers are international. I followed your advice from earlier this year and submitted my books to the Canadian Library Program, which is the Public Lending Rights Program. And I'm pretty sure I will not be receiving any check next year since I highly doubt my books are in libraries right now, but I'd really like to change that. Hope to see you at NINC and 20 Books Vegas. Keep up the amazing work. Thanks, Carol. Looking forward to seeing you. I know I'm definitely going to be seeing you at NINC in just a few weeks. And I'm glad that you signed up for the Public Lending Rights Program in Canada. If you are an author in the UK or Australia or other Commonwealth countries, most likely there is a public lending right program and you should check it out. And thanks, Carol. I will definitely be doing an episode focusing on you, your books, and libraries. And I will talk about the best ways to get print and ebooks into the different library systems and methodologies and strategies that you can use to get the attention of the appropriate libraries for your books. Carol, thanks for that email. If you'd like to leave a comment and reflect on something that you heard on the show, you can do that on the appropriate episode at starkreflections.ca or you can email me mark at marklesley.ca. Just let me know if it's okay for me to read your email on the podcast. And that's it for the comment section of the episode. Let's hear from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a way for indie authors to get their audiobooks out into the audiobook market. And that includes the large players like Audible and Google and Apple and Kobo, as well as many of the library systems and smaller audiobook retailers out there. Now, one of the things I really like about Findaway Voices is that if you're using them to find a professional narrator, and you don't have to, you have a choice. You can bring your own audio files or you can use them for a narrator. If you go ahead and use them as a narrator, it's not just an open RFP where you put in your proposal and what you're looking for and then anyone in the community can respond to it. It is a curated community of professional narrators, and not only that, but with Findaway Voices, you actually get a project manager who is assigned to your project. They actually look at the project, so there's a professional there who works in audiobooks and knows who the professional narrators are, knows who's done different styles of books, looks at what you, what you specify, and then selects usually three to five professionals that they think will work. You give them a lesson, you see what you like, what you don't like, you give them feedback. You can either move on to hear an actual audition piece or a sample piece from one of those narrators. And it's a really amazing guided process because when you're getting into audiobooks, chances are you don't know much about that. And so you have a vetted professional that's working with a project manager on the side for Findaway Voices. And that's one of the perks of using a system like that. Not to mention the fact that you can control the audiobook price and, and the other great control that you have as an indie author publishing audiobooks. And you can learn more about Findaway Voices and how you can leverage them over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Well, that's it for the introductory matter for this episode. We're already 10 minutes in. I'm going to skip the personal update and get right on to this interview with David Wind. Hey, David, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. So to give my listeners a bit of a background um, about you as a writer, when did you start writing? What kind of stuff do you write? Okay, well, I started writing a long, long time ago. I, my first book was published in 1981. Okay. I won't, I won't even go into what that book was because I'm not supposed to. <laughs> 
Uh, oh, see, now that makes me want to ask more about it, but you, <laughs> you're not I, I supposed to. I understand that, and that's your point. Okay, let, okay, let me put it like this. Uh, I, I, I wrote under a woman's name for several uh, novels back in the 80s. I so this say, was a traditionally <laughs> published book that you wrote under a pseudonym? Is that what that was? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. So uh, you, by contract, and, and, you're not allowed and, to reveal who you are. No, no, not by contract, just oh. because I don't do it. Uh, but you know what? What the <laughs> hell? Um, I, I was also one of the original members of the RWA back in 1981. So Eight, that'll give you a little. Wow. Okay. That'll give you a little hint of uh, what I was writing at that point. Okay. And and I, I I wrote those books because I wanted to break into publishing. It was the only way I could get in. Okay. And were you that was traditional publishing eighty one, correct? Right? You were working uh, for a traditional publisher. That was, that, okay. so that was Silhouette and uh then uh Simon and Schuster as pocket uh, Okay, cool. Uh, so tell me about that. So you said you had long wanted to be a writer uh, and then you said, okay, this is the only way to break in the market. I'm doing this because this means a lot to me. Let's go back exactly. to your origin. What, what, what were you really passionate about writing before you said, okay, I'm going to make a business decision and write these romance novels? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I was passionate about writing thrillers, about writing more detective and about science fiction. I grew up okay. on science fiction. I mean, when I was 12 years old, I read the entire uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs Tarzan series. By the time I was 13, I had re read, I, I, I had finished the Tarzan series, the Venusian series, and the Martian series, <laughs> and okay. the Center of the Earth series okay. of his, and just formed a lifelong love of science fiction. So... Let's describe your realm as a writer. So you've read these stories, you were fascinated, you were inspired. Did you run out and grab the nearest typewriter? Did you have notebooks? What was your, what was, what? No, what okay. Little I, I, the writer tried writing. I, I didn't bother in, in high school. High school, I was a terrible student. I, okay. I you know, English and math were my worst subjects. <laughs> so how could I be a writer if English was one of my worst subjects? Um, when I was in college, I started to write. And I could not get past two pages before I threw it in the garbage. It was so bad. Really? I, I, I you know, I could outline, I could do, a, do everything, I could do the narration, but I couldn't do dialogue. Okay. And, and no matter what, what I wrote, it just sounded terrible in my head as I wrote it. So I set it aside for a while. I, uh, I went to... Um, Southern Tech in in uh, Georgia. Then I then I went to join martial law. After that, I chose not to be a lawyer. Okay. Was uh, just something about it bothered me, and that was the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> I had no problem in in in, in the courtroom, but the paperwork was just okay. I, I it. so I didn't bother with that, and then I got a great job offer to move to Chicago and work for Playboy. So I did that for a while. Okay, cool. Uh, was it the legal uh, legal team, or how did where did how did you work? No, 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 no. Actually, I worked in the clubs. Oh wow! Which okay, was, I, was, I was okay, and I think. Well, you were an editor because you know selling a short story to Playboy was the place to be for writers back in the day. Yeah, no, that didn't work too well for me. No, that okay. that that hadn't worked, and I was just too caught up in life to worry about writing at that point. I I didn't sit down and start writing till I was. 28, 29 years old. Okay. And, and uh, what were you writing then? Uh, I was just trying, trying to write anything. And the first thing I wrote was a thriller. And um, I, I, I wrote it just to see if I could write it, if I could get through an entire book. And I did. I handed it to a couple of people, uh, friends who said, wow, this is pretty good. So I, so I did the, uh, you know, I, I went based on friends. Big mistake, but I went based on what friends <laughs> had to say. because They weren't about to hurt my feelings. And I sent it out to an agent. Somebody told me about it, William Morris. Well, he actually liked the book. He thought it was a terrible book, but he liked my writing. Okay. And asked me to write something else. So I wrote something else, and it just didn't work. But 
I had gotten the bug so heavily at that point, I couldn't stop writing. And one of my clients at the time um, was, was uh, a romance editor. And I said to her, I said, listen, here's, I, I want to write, here's what I've written. And she came back and said, if you think you could write a romance, write me a romance and we'll go from there. So I, I, I love historicals. And Frank Slaughter, uh, um, Frank Yerby, all these people were just my favorite as well. I, I was very eclectic in, in what I like to read, from, from, from historicals to thrillers to sci-fi. Um, and so I wrote a historical, and she bought that and two others. And that's how I started off. Oh, wow. Okay. And then... And, um, well, then I wrote in 1985, uh, my agent, I don't know if you know, if you knew who Kate Duffy was. No. Uh, Kate Duffy was considered the single best, as far as I know, um, editor for, for romance in, in the, ever. And she was my editor, but for more than romance. And, um, we put out a, we started a, um, a medieval fantasy. And in fact, one, one of my favorite sci-fi fantasy authors was Andre Norton. And she was one of the reasons that, that ex inspired me to do it, to, to, to use a pseudonym as a woman anyway, because that's what she did in, in, in the fifties. You couldn't break into science fiction if you were a woman. So she wrote under a man's name and actually legally changed her name to a man's name. But she was a wonderful person. And, and my agent got her, her address and I wrote her a letter asking her to, to review the book and to, to give me a blurb if she would like. Because at that point, everything was print and it was always blurbs that you wanted. Right. Um, and she, she did. And then we kept up a correspondence for years. And she basically mentored me in, in writing, which... which you really were mentored by... Andre, the Andre Norton. Andre. Wow. Yes, yes, <laughs> well, I mean, she, you know, uh, growing up with science fiction is kind of like Andre Norton's one of the figureheads of, of amazing yeah. fiction. Wow. Yeah. yeah. She was a wonderful, wonderful lady. House filled with cats. She loved her cats. <laughs> she, lo she, she loved Native Americans and cats. Okay. And, awesome. And if you read her books, you know that cats of all various species... Yes alien as well as uh, American and, uh, and Western cats uh, were there. And oh. um, she, she was just such a great push for me. My only short story was in one of her Witch World books that she asked me to write. Wow. Problem, what problem was it was 40 pages, which was only supposed to be like 18 and 19 <laughs> pages. She did some magic. She and she and the editor she was working with and cut it down about eight pages and let it run at that. Wow. So that was really <laughs> great. Um, but but when I wrote this book and, and it came out, my editor left Pocketbook and a new editor took over and she said, we can't put this out. We paid you too much money and we can't put this out um, under your name. It's got to go under your romance name. And we had a big fight. Wow. And it came out. It came out as me writing as the romance name, right. and we just, I just, you know, that that was it. And the book fell on its face. They lost a ton of money because they wouldn't listen to my agent, to me, or to the other people there. And so that one, that one didn't work. But however, it's done really well as an ebook, so I, I can't complain. That's Queen of Nights. Okay. And that's something that sort of the, when the rights reverted back to you, you said, okay, I'm going to do this justice now. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that, that's what happened that I put it out. And it, as I said, it's done really well. Okay. So, so uh, I have no complaints there. And from that point on, I just started writing. My first hardcover was, was a thriller called The Hype Maneuver, uh, which was put out by Putnam. Okay. And, uh, I've, d I've done uh, quite a few thrillers, mysteries, and I have a sci-fi series that somehow it was never intended as a YA, but it ended up on the YA list. And, it, and you know, I, the first one is uh, downloaded free as, as part of it, you know, the marketing thing to get uh, the rest of the series going. And that book has been 
since it's been downloaded in, in the top 10, top 15 in three different YA categories for the last year. Oh, wow. It's been wow. really good. But I've been downloaded close to 70,000 copies now. That's amazing. So you, you have this rich history in traditional publishing with, with big, big publishers and agents and hardcovers and mass markets and all the, 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 the things. When did you first um, start to explore self-publishing or indie publishing? Okay. Indie publishing. Yeah, and I call it indie publishing. I, ha I hate the word self-publishing because it's a lot more than publishing yourself. Exactly. Uh, yeah. uh, um, it, it was around, I don't know, the tur turn of the uh, century, the millenn millennium market. As early as 2000, it. really? Uh, no, no, no. It, what happened was I got certain rights back. So I went to the uh, iUniverse, uh, or the Authors Guild. Okay. Um, had to deal with iUniverse, so it didn't cost anything to put out, to republish the books uh, with them. And so that's Wait when Wait a second, the Authors Guild had a partnership with iUniverse? Right. With, that's the, it, but back Wow. In, <laughs> back in print, I believe it was uh. called. Yeah, because iUniverse was a POD, uh, one of the major first right. early POD companies. It okay, the, it was, I think it was the first one as far as far as as a combination of it was it was what what they call a vanity press on one side, and it was an arm for traditionally published authors to get their books back into print after they uh -huh. received the rights back. Okay, so that way you could keep a book that was out of print. You could actually right. keep it virtually in print on demand, right? Always available exactly. for fans uh, because the publisher's given up on it, and 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 now you can actually okay. So and that was and that was the exactly. early days of self publishing when it when it that had was, a stigma. The, yeah, yeah. And and what happened was in two thousand eight, Amazon came out with their version of print on demand, their version of independent publishing, and I jumped on that bandwagon as quickly as I could. I, I was really fed up with traditional publishing. I didn't want to deal with the agents, and and they primarily wanted me to write one thing, and I wanted to write something else. It never right. gave me a chance to explore what I wanted to do as a writer. Okay. So um, I, I, I'm a genre jumper. Yeah, you read a lot and you write a lot, right? Okay. Science fiction. And, and, and these are the things that I, I love doing. And, and I get bored writing the same thing over five, six, seven, eight uh, novels. So I want to do other things. And, and I, I think everybody, every creative person likes to explore. Uh, and this is, this is part of the process. But in 2008, I, they did their print on demand. And I believe it was the same year they came out with um, with, with the ebooks, with yeah. the Kindle. But when I first started on print on demand, I published the book I had wanted to do for 30 years. Okay. I wanted to write a, a, a 50s style noir detective, hard boiled detective story. So I did. Okay. And it was so much fun. And I realized how much it invigorated me to do this. And I said, the hell with the traditional publishing at this stage. Let me just go have fun. Wow. And that's what I'm doing. And I think I've, I, I haven't been rushing through it. I haven't been publishing two and three and four and five books a year, which I think is a huge mistake by a lot of authors. Um, but that's besides the point. It's my personal opinion. And, right. and I, I publish roughly one a year, sometimes two. Okay. It just depends. I put out, I think, maybe... 13 or 14 uh, books since uh, 2008. And primarily, um, are, are they across genres, just like you're, you're following your passion? Oh, or? yeah. I've got, I've, uh, it's actually a paranormal thriller that could be considered a romance. I've got five science fiction novels. I've got four or five um, thrillers and detective stories. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just enjoying uh, what I'm doing. And in fact, currently I'm, I'm working on a uh, middle grade, just oh. fooling around with a sci-fi middle grade. Okay. So I have to ask because you're, you're training or your upbringing in traditional publishing and, and, and the, and the, the mystique of the writer was you sat at your typewriter and, and the muse danced around you and you and you created these things and all you had to do was ship that manuscript off and you know you worked with an editor and they found designers and they did all 
that other stuff and you worried mostly about writing how did how did you come to terms with the fact that oh uh, i have to take care of the editor the coverage is like uh, you're in charge it's not nothing self about it the only self is self directed but the fact is it's not oh good agent picked it up they'll get it to a publisher then an editor will be assigned et cetera, et cetera, as opposed to you going ooh i have to figure out that maybe uh, you know a designer or an editor i work with for my science fiction is not going to be the same as a noir how did you how did you bridge that okay it, it, it was actually a lot simpler for me um, okay i i had had a disagreement with my agent um and we parted ways and and i was thinking about going with another agent and then i got involved in the indie publishing um with, with that first book um which was angels in mourning which was the, the noir book and I, I i turned around and i started learning and seeing and i realized that what i really wanted to do was publish what i wanted what i liked to read and the way i liked to read it i didn't want to publish the the way my editors did which was changing things around and doing different things because they were looking at a specific segment of a reading audience right and i didn't want that segment i wanted more than just that segment i wanted to cross genres i wanted other people to look at my stuff and to read it as well um so so i i i just delved into what was going on and how to do it it took me probably four or five weeks to figure out how to really format the book properly to get it into print, how to do the different things. Then the marketing, I had no idea about marketing at all until later on when, when, I, when I started doing the eBooks. And then I realized there's other ways of, of, of promoting books other than just getting reviews and sending out uh, basically mass emails to all the different reviewers to get that out because that was the only way you could publish it unless you, unless you had a couple of hundred grand to uh, advertise in PW and the Times. Right, right. So, so, so I had to learn and I taught myself. And, and the one thing I, I realized after the first two or three books and I kept rereading them and finding errors and mistakes that I made, that this was not a good thing. And I had to figure out the best way to make this book the way it should be if it came out of a traditional publisher these books shouldn't be any different right. they should be the same whether it's traditionally published or independently published they should be edited properly but not necessarily the the way a, a, a publishing house edits which is is to change the way the writer does it into what they feel the public wants right. i just wanted the english correct I wanted everything about the punctuation, the proper way. I wanted a readable book, right, not, right. not just something that was thrown out. And that's what I did. And so I, I found editors. I found this for the cover. I tried my own covers. And boy, did they look terrible. And, <laughs> and you know, it, 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 it's a whole thing. And in, in my new book, I, I've explained a lot of this, but that's, we haven't gotten there yet, so let me let that go. But that's, um, yeah, it's a good segue. We'll be getting to that shortly because I was going to segue that right into talking about your new book and how you use those experiences for uh, for helping other writers. Right, right. Um, it just it, it 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 was a long, long learning curve. It wasn't an easy learning curve because your mindset is on what you write not how to present it to the public. That was always somebody else's job in traditional publishing. Right. But the difference in indie publishing is that when you're finished and you've got a really good product, man, you feel good about that. <laughs> it's like, wow, I've got a book here that'll stand up against any other book. Right. And, 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 you know, it's produced professionally. It's the, it's the same product that you would get from a traditional publisher, except it's coming out of an independent method of doing it. Just like the, the way the way music has changed, and you have so many independent uh, artists out there. Right. This is just I, I, I think just just a part of the evolution of publishing. Okay. It, it, yeah, I think it really is. So let's talk specifically about the indie writer's handbook. Okay. Uh, it's going to be released September first. Uh, it's in pre-order right now, okay. uh, but you know, in, 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 in just a short while, it'll be out there. I guess, you know, o over the last several years, I, you just hear comments about how, how 
in how self-publishing quote it is is just vanity publishing that the people who do self-publishing don't do it correctly and i started to get really annoyed about it because good books are good books and, and there are just thousands of indie writers out there who publish good books you know at the beginning it started everybody just threw threw stuff against the wall and saw what stuck Right. And a lot of people made their own covers and a lot of people did their own editing and there were tons of mistakes and the colors look, the covers look bad. And even though they were not expensive, people stopped buying because they just weren't good books. And, and over the last, I would say, four or five years has been, been a metamorphosis where, where the, the uh, writers are starting to understand that it's just as important to have a high quality product as it is high quality writing right. the two two are not inseparable in fact they're both necessary to make the book enjoyable for a reader okay um, and, and that's the way i've always looked at it however recently i i moved to florida and recently uh and and i'm a member of the nwa uh, mystery writers of america and i received a phone call a year and a half ago saying we, we, you've been nominated to run as vice president. And I get, excuse me, <laughs> you don't even know me. <laughs> yeah, but we, we, we need full members to run for the board. Would you do us a favor and do this? I said, sure, no problem. I'd be happy to. And that's when it started hitting me there how ind indie writers are looked at. Now, the NW MWA allows indie writers in. You can get a right. book all you need is, I, I don't remember whether it's 3000 or $5,000 in a year of sales. That's not a big deal. It, you know, a couple of thousand books is not a, is not a huge amount to expect an indie writer to uh, sell. Right. Um, but the older traditional members seem to have a, a, some resentment in there because they look at indie writing as vanity press, as self-publishing. And, and it, it really hit home that these traditional writers really did look down upon us and it bothered me it bothered me a lot and i sat down and i started thinking about how how can i impress indie writers on how important it is to be professional in what they do right and not just especially the first timers who have no concept about how to get through this publishing morass if you want to call it that right um and, and and bring out a book that that's as good a quality as that in traditional publishing and i started outlining and started trying to figure it out and then i realized i was having a conversation with myself on paper <laughs> and that's what i ended up doing i said listen i i've never written a non-fiction book I've written a couple of articles, I did blogs, things like that, but I've never written written a nonfiction. I just sat down and I wrote it. Right. And and I wrote the conversation. Of, here's what you need to do, and this is the way we should be doing it. And here's what I found, and this is other things, and here's places I vetted that you can use, and here's editors, and here's cover artists, and different things. And you you know, pick and choose from fifty dollars for a cover for 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 a, a, a pre-made cover that's very good quality up to five hundred dollars for a custom made cover that's up to you but but right. there are always ways to do it and do it properly and what i what what it is to me it's a handbook it's a guide on how to to go from your final draft to publication to your launch publication and 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 you know, hybrid authors, the, those traditional authors who are now stepping in to the indie world and who, who have their backlist that they want to publish because they've gotten their rights back and they want to earn money, need to know how to do this properly. It's still, even though you're a traditional writer, you've never published a book. It's time for you to learn how and what the steps are to publish it. So the handbook lists, I think there are 18 steps that start from step one, which is at the end of your final uh, and end of your final draft, through the editing, through the cover, through the proofreading, uh, in, into the beta reading, how to find reviews, how to, how to do the various things, marketing techniques for the new book, 
if, if you're out there and your book has been out there for a while, then the marketing is different than if you are launching a book and getting it going. And th this book is for those who are, who, who are getting things going and we need to make, to, 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 to show them how to do it professionally and how to do it properly. Okay. Wow. So it sounds like, and you've just done an, an amazing job, which is something I always try to help writers with is define your ideal audience. And you've, and you've defined two very specific sections of writers that would benefit tremendously from this book. So that's awesome. So if you're listening and you recognized yourself in one of those areas as a, you know, someone with the traditional experience and you're looking to get into indie publishing or somebody who's just getting started with indie publishing, sounds like this is the book for you. Okay, I'll stop talking to the listeners now. I'm now going to talk to David again. Uh, <laughs> that was just a little, a weird moment I had. <laughs> so, no, so, okay. Okay. And the book is coming out uh, in early September of 2019. It's up for pre-order everywhere? It's up for pre-order everywhere. It, it, you know, pre-order it on all the majors, at Kobo, um, Apple, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and, you know, a few of the ancillary uh, right. uh, areas that, that you buy from. Um, Ebook, print book as well. Print book will be out out in September as well. It'd be an ebook. Okay. It'll be an EPUB. It'll be in Mobi. Uh, okay, excellent. And I imagine it will also be available through the library system, so writers can always go and ask their local library to order in this book when it comes out in September, so they can absolutely. read it immediately. Okay, excellent. absolutely. In fact, I'm, I'm in the process of contacting various libraries around the country. And just apprising them that, that this book is available. Is available as well. Um, excellent. Thank you. Uh, David, uh, where can where can my listeners find out more about you, about your fiction as well as a little bit more information about this book? Okay, yeah, they can go right to the website, which is uh, literally davidwin.com, D-A-V-I-D-W-I-N-D dot C-O-M, H-T-T-P-S. And... Uh, get there. I don't sell anything on the website. I don't even attempt to. It's just, it's about me. It's about my books. Okay, excellent. And there's obviously links to your books on the various retailers from there that people can kind of follow through. Uh, okay. absolutely. Excellent. absolutely. Excellent. And they can always go to, um, if they want to check on this book specifically, they can go to books to read.com forward slash writer's handbook. That's nice and easy and very universal. Thanks, David, so much for spending the time with me today and sharing some of your insights and wisdom with writers. I appreciate it, Mark. I appreciate your, uh, your sitting here with me and doing this. Well, that's the interview with David. And as promised, after the interview, I'm going to share how you can win a print, signed print copy, an advanced reader's copy, of David's book, which is being released September 1st, 2019. All you have to do is leave a comment on this episode, episode 81 at starkreflections.ca. You can ask a question about indie publishing in general. You can ask a question about traditional publishing in general. Or you can leave your own reflection. And that's over at starkreflections.ca. Now, I'll be accepting entries uh, for the random draw for one print copy signed by David to be mailed to you up until the end of the day Eastern Time on Friday, August 16th. The winners will be announced uh, the following week on the, um, on the Friday, August 23rd episode. And all patrons will, of course, automatically be entered to win a copy of the book as well. So I have one copy for people who leave a comment, a random draw, and one randomly drawn one from the existing patrons. Now speaking of this opportunity, in the very last draw that I had, we had two winners. So from the comment section, MZ Low won. Congratulations, MZ. I've uh, left a comment over on the, the blog post at starkreflections.ca asking you to please email me at mark at marklesley.ca so you can let me know where I'm going to ship that copy to. And as well, patron Linda Sterling won. Congratulations, Linda. I have contacted you on Patreon. And I see you've already gotten back to me. Thank you so much. You, those copies will be on the way very shortly. And of course, there's the opportunity to win David's new book and to get your hands on it before it's even available to the general public. And thanks, David, for your generosity and donating those copies. 
Now, the podcast does have a corporate sponsor. Find Away Voices is the corporate sponsor for this episode, and that pays for the hosting fees for the show. But if you're interested in supporting the podcast, you can do that over on patreon.com, and that'll also give you access to additional audio, video, and text content that I make available. There will be a forthcoming episode in the next week or two, um, which is in my series of reflections on other podcasts, things that I think about when I'm listening to another podcast. And it doesn't have to necessarily be a writing podcast. It's just something that I think will tie back to the writer's life. So you can be a patron of the show if you check that out over on patreon.com slash starkreflections. You can also support the show just by sharing it with a friend that you think would find it valuable. Thank you so much for being a listener to the podcast. And in closing out this podcast, I wanted to reflect on one of the things that David said. It's more or less the reason why he decided to write the Indie Writer's Handbook. And it was the way that the members that he worked with in the local writing group looked at traditional publishing versus indie publishing or self-publishing or, as they saw it, vanity publishing. And he wanted to be clear to both beginning writers as well as traditionally published writers, the actual steps involved and the actual process of indie writing and what it means to be a professional indie writer. And again, he said he hates the term self-publishing. Now, I can understand where he's coming from because I've also faced that as well. Growing up in the traditional bookselling industry and, and basically cutting my chops by sending stories out to be published by magazines, I kind of there was no real self-publishing or indie publishing. There was only vanity publishing in the early days. It was just the, the, the companies that tried to sucker you out of money. And, and ironically, and that's why I... Uh, when David said that the uh, Authors Guild had a partnership with iUniverse, it's like iUniverse is one of those companies that really seems to be there just to take money from authors and charge them for services they don't need. Sure, they have professional people and professional editors who work for them and do design and things like that. But in a lot of ways, their main business is selling services to writers, not making money off the sales of the books. And that, to me, is vanity publishing. And that, to me, in many cases, if the author is not aware of what's going on, is a place where they're really just trying to take money from authors rather than servicing the needs of the author and the dreams that the author has of seeing their book in print and potentially even making some money off that. Now, not every author wants to make money off that, and I completely understand that. But I do rather respect companies who offer services to authors and are clear about the things that they're offering and what they're offering, rather than trying to sell them marketing services in pretending that they're actually going to get the book into bookstores or get it reviewed by journals and all those other things. So I'm, I'm not a fan of that kind of thing. And I see that's where these were the types of companies that existed in the early days. And of course, anyone who was in the writing business, they immediately saw self-publishing and vanity publishing together. And that's where they got that perception. So even when I wrote an article for Write Magazine, which is the magazine of the writer's Union of Canada, I wrote a column for them, an article for something called Dispatches, which is just different perspectives. And my title was Two Publishing Paths Diverged in a Digital World, A Stark Look at Self-Publishing. And because I knew that the audience was primarily, probably 90 to 98% traditionally published authors who had been uh, trained and grown through the publishing industry the way I had, they probably looked down their nose at self-publishing. So in order to get them to read the article, I started the article from from their perspective because it was my perspective at one time, and I thought that would be an easier way. So the article opens with the quote, self-publishing is the best way to kill your writing career. And I followed that with a second paragraph, uh, and the second paragraph reads, I let those harsh words spoken by a respected fellow writer who was earning a living as a full-time writer hang in the air. But I wanted to say except I knew better. And so I get into the fact that I actually had the prejudice against self-publishing in the early days when I saw some of the real uh, horrible gems that were that were coming out. Uh, the, the really crappy books that were brought to me as a bookstore manager or someone who was trying to curate local titles and went, 
whoa, this could have used an editor or a, an actual cover designer or something like that. So again, this was early days. This is uh, late 90s, uh, the early aughts, um, before there were really, really good tools out there for authors. And before there were even you know, legitimate freelancers as opposed to some of the companies that were just there to take uh, authors' money. But one of the reasons I started the article that way is I wanted people to get into it. I wanted them to follow that eye-opening experience that I had had myself as a bookseller to come to understand that self-publishing was not a dirty word, that the only self in self-publishing is self-directed, that you're professional, that you hire the right professionals, that you hire editors and cover designers, etc. And so again, I think even though indie publishing has come a really, really far away and there are authors making more money than ever before because of all the opportunities they now have afforded to them, we still have a long way to go. There's still a lot of prejudice and there's still a lot of per perception that indie publishing is vanity publishing and self-publishing is vanity publishing. And I think we're still a long ways away from people properly understanding what this world is all about. So folks like David, who are taking the time to help share that, and folks like you, if you understand that indie publishing and self-publishing is really just a different way of approaching the same quality product. It's just a different way of distributing the book into the reader's hands, a way that's become more prevalent with the advent of digital publishing. It's fair to share that and to talk about that and to continue to talk about it until people understand that self-publishing and indie publishing is not necessarily vanity publishing, even though if you look at a Venn diagram, you can see that there is a bit of an overlap, even though the approach is different. It's a different style, a different approach. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you enjoyed the reflection. Thanks so much for being a listener to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. Again, this is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre, wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.